RPGs have some of the most iconic designs in the gaming scene. With a strong legacy since the early 90s stride of the Super Nintendo and early PlayStation titles, the genre has grown to include so many amazing mechanics that it's hard to fixate in on any one set. Battles are a huge draw for these games as a whole, and a title that's able to make grinding not feel repetitive is worth all kinds of praise. In particular, the systems that really stick out in these games to me are built around a wide amount of choice and player agency, as you tweak and perfect your comps for proper battling. So in this installment, I want to focus in on 7 games that do especially invigorating jobs and encapsulating these ideas in the mechanics. Hey all you role players, I'm Skip the Tutorial, and this is Game Bites, an appreciation anthology of the best bits of design that gaming has to offer. And hey, if this is your first time here, then focus blast that subscribe for weekly insights into your favorite game designs. Square Enix has defined the RPG genre several times over. It's hard to have a conversation about these types of games without bringing up their contributions, from old school classics like Chrono Trigger and Super Mario RPG, to their powerhouse reach with the Final Fantasy series. And while each of these brings their own set of fantastic features into the gaming scene, one title I'd love to give credence to is their recent release of Octopath Traveler. With some Back to Roots gameplay and a beautiful aesthetic to boot, there's plenty to praise in this title, and I want to mainly focus in on the break and boost systems this game offers up. The beauty of these mechanics, in my opinion, lies in how they play off one another. With the boost system, the player gets the opportunity to use three boosts each turn and slap a temporary power up on each of their heroes. From this alone, there's an interesting give and take in how you spend these juice ups. Do you supercharge all three at once for an easy takedown on a more straightforward enemy? Or in a different scenario, hold back for a full set of orbs to lay some severe damage on a boss in a later turn. But partnering this with Octopath's key breaking system is where the depth of the combat truly shines through. You see, enemies will have their shield point bars during a fight, which you can diminish by landing some hits with their weakness, such as axes, fire, or some other branch of offense. Weakening these set numbers of points will eventually score you that all-important break, which will both cancel its current and next turns as well as effectively giving a 50% boost to your attacks on the foes. So blending the two systems, you can launch a boost in sync with a break to deal massive amounts of damage and potentially save your hide from some multi-turn charge attack that the monster was planning on hitting you with soon. Having to continually reconsider the scheduling and planning of your battle's phases with the enemy is great and makes the multifaceted combat of Octopath stand out. Going on a murderous rampage is commonplace in your average RPG. It's the entire backbone for concepts like grinding for levels. But when Undertale came to the gaming scene in 2015, it brought with it a compelling alternative to combat. This Kickstarter success turned any fame storm allowed players to work their entire way through the game as either a pacifist or a genocidal maniac, and everywhere in between, should you decide to spare all your foes. Undertale gives full reins to finish off an encounter as a delightful conversation, where you persuade, compliment, and dance your way to a peaceful agreement. One of the gems of picking this route is getting to experience two of the game's other selling points, the bullet hell style dodging system, and Toby Fox's comedically brilliant writing. But conversely, if you aren't interested in playing the peacekeeper, Toby Fox provides the open opportunity to end each encounter with violence, which allows the more traditional RPG progression systems of leveling up and switching out items to shine through the gameplay. And admittedly, there's benefits and downfalls to both sides. A pacifist run makes each encounter an arduous truce agreement and leaves you at your same underpowered state throughout your entire journey. Yet a genocide run powers you up at the cost of other elements falling out of place. Worth mentioning here is that your decided path, be it peace, murder, or a neutral mix of both, will have significant impacts on the story of the title. This gives an exhilarating amount of weight to how you interact with what would be mindless encounters in other games, making even the smallest of meetings have huge ramifications on your whole playthrough. As much as I love turn-based RPGs, it's hard to say they're always the most exciting. After selecting your attacks, you and your enemy both sit back and watch the show play out, all the while hoping your opponent didn't set up an offense that you weren't prepared for taking. So any system that adds a bit more flair to this traditional style is well and welcome in my heart, and leave it to the paper-thin plumber himself to breathe some new life into the genre with the Paper Mario Action Command system. Ever since Mario first received the ability from Twink in the first game on the N64, it's been a series hallmark. When pressing a button at the right moment, the player can use this feature to beef up attacks for increased amounts of damage. These timed hits emphasize an extra level of depth to the combat, as selecting the move isn't the end, but the player can also flesh out their skills in a new vertical to score massive crits. Furthermore, this system keeps you from just being a sitting duck during your opponent's turn, as it also provides the opportunity for a well-timed block to protect you from some unneeded damage. And hey, let's not forget the satisfying tactile feel of pulling back the hammer on the analog stick back in the original title. 
Overall, the enjoyment of keeping your agency even after the moves are laid out is not to be understated. And I think it's one of the core reasons the combat in these games is so iconic and beloved by players to this day. If there are two things the Mother series is known for, it's making some absolute jams for the soundtrack and offering a hilariously charming twist on the RPG genre tropes. Coming off the iconic release of the game's original sequel, Earthbound on the SNES, the third installment, Mother 3, would need to bring some new mechanic to rightfully take its place in the series, which is what the developers packed in with the sound battle system. When using a basic attack against a goon, pressing the A or L button in rhythm to the beat will net a volley of follow-up attacks to trash through that foe. But where these beats come from is the real intrigue in my opinion. After putting an enemy to sleep, you'll be able to pick up on the sound pattern of their heartbeat, which you can then memorize to shoot for that perfect 16-hit combo, as well as the cheering crowd sound bite that plays afterward. But learning these different music signatures is tough when just facing random encounter enemies. So luckily the game provides a sweet way to practice these combos in the battle memory menu, by allowing the player to train their rhythm against an endless enemy encounter, provided they've already squared up against the foe, Mother 3 sets you up to be the proper musical RPG genius for going through your fights. And I think that's where the system shines, in the ways that it gives players goals for improvement past just stat boosts and EXP drops. Games handle wounds in different ways. Whereas most games end their damage systems at the physical, few of them touch on the more psychological side of fighting, which admittedly makes sense. It's hard to connect with your party member's emotional baggage when you as the player are riding high off the sweet loot you just scored. But when it comes to taking a stab at this side, I reckon Darkest Dungeon does a great job with its stress mechanic. As team leader of your set of Dungeoneers, you'll be edging your hires onto the depths of horrendous dungeons, forcing them to fight in increasingly violent encounters at the expense of their sanity. Subjecting your heroes to these conditions will accumulate varying amounts of stress, which brings along some game-shifting changes. Beating and breaking down their spirits can lead to serious drawbacks, as unlike their physical injuries, these stats aren't reset when returning home. To get rid of these impacts, they'll need to take on treatment, be it drinking, prayer, or medicine. Otherwise, you run the risk of driving these folks to their breaking point, and causing some new quirks that crush their usability. Like kleptomania as they shave loot off the top for their benefit, or maybe provide that extra stat push they need for greatness. This all creates a compelling duality as you test the limits of each hero in your possession. And as there's no shortage of free lackeys to score, the game provides you with full means to discover your moral boundaries. Because after all, the characters are as broken as you make them. Nino Kuni was a treat of a release back in 2010 on the DS and a particularly compelling series come 2013 with the release of The Wrath of the White Witch for the PlayStation 3. And with gorgeous animations courtesy of Level 5 to get players in the door, the game also offered up a surprisingly deep combat system with its metamorphosis-focused familiars. So when the newest installment, Nino Kuni 2, shifted its style away from these little creatures, it was a bit of a shock to the system for the fans. Despite this, I think this title brought its taste of combat complexity with the help of the Higgledies. These little folks are a mainstay of the combat in this game, and share a chunk of functionality to their familiar ancestors. With your unique ability to see the things, you score some of your first Higgledies early on in the game, which opens up a new planning side to the fights. You can swap in and out four of them to provide additional help to your main squad, but keep in mind that each of them has a set cost, so you can't bring four three-cost Higgledies when dealing with your 10-cost limit. So what do these beans do? By default, they'll aid you in battles by checking out HP and MP orbs, using their basic attacks, and even offering up some extra defensive shields for your team. But if you dig more in depth with their strategies, you'll find that the multitude of Higgledies that you can collect and utilize have different special abilities that can beef up your primary members. Also, with balancing out personalities, like an outgoing Higgledy with one that's a little bit more shy, for maximum efficacy, there's an entire world of options packed in these little guys. And I think that's the overall beauty and the variety, seen in the different ways you can pair up your Higgledy squad, since you'll ultimately select the best accompaniment for your main playstyle, making sure there's an exhilarating amount of choice in even the side characters. If you're looking for an RPG with some flair, then the Persona franchise has it in spades. Touting a fantastically jazzy soundtrack, and some UI design that looks better than half the games I've played this year, there's more than enough to latch onto in this title. Chief among these is the pumped up combat system, which breaks past so many of the genre's typical expectations. Of the real wave of features swimming around in each of these fights, I believe the series' utterly unique approach is best demonstrated in the hold-up mechanic. For those who aren't familiar with the title, or haven't played long enough to experience the system firsthand, the way that hold-ups work is that after knocking down your opponents by using the help of their various weaknesses, your squad will take up arms nearby and claim a hold-up around the foe. From here, you're given three choices. 
an all-out attack, a discussion, or the ability to break formation. Using an all-out attack will net a severe amount of damage against your enemies, and is a likely strategy for an instant kill, but I think this system takes a special place with its talk option. Choosing this path opens up a slew of new opportunities. Do you shake down the demon for money and items and stack up some sweet loot grinds? Or follow the difficult route and ask the enemy to lend you their power? Selecting the latter will require a sizable knowledge of your opponent's personality and the answers necessary for that personality. But pulling off a successful negotiation will provide you with a slick new persona for your disposal. Overall, the sheer amount of branching opportunities that come from this one mechanic creates a considerable amount of variation out of seemingly simple situations, especially considering the immediate and long-term impacts of your decision in these standoffs. Hey there, mache on this one in the top right about the 7 platform mechanics you need to play or use a potion in the bottom rate for another video. If you want to support the channel and stay updated on future Game Bytes episodes, then whack a smack on that subscribe. But until then, take care, and you have a good one, alright?